Well, thank you for your welcome. Um, we've got the uh, computers all sorted out. That wasn't my computer that did that. So what we're doing today is we're looking at just a select part of the God Delusion because it's a fairly large book. And I'm looking mainly at Chapter 4. And I'm looking at a scientific response to what uh, Professor Dawkins says in Chapter 4. If you're interested in more the theological side of things, there's a, a number of books out. One I've got here is The Dawkins Delusion by Alistair McGrath, who actually is a... I believe he's a professor in the same university as Professor Dawkins, who's written a more theological response to some of Dawkins' uh, arguments. So if you're interested in that, we have a bookstall here, actually, for books, if you want to buy some books that talk, uh, discuss the creation-evolution debate. They're all written from uh, a, a Christian point of view, defending uh, creation as opposed to evolution, which is my position. But this evening's topic is... They're looking at the scientific evidence that Professor Dawkins puts forward to suggest that there is probably not a God, and why I, uh, after reading that, come to still maintain my position that there is a God, but we'll get to that later. I want to start off with a quote, and the next time somebody tells you that something is true, why not say to them, what kind of evidence is there for that? And if they can't give you a good answer, I hope you'll think very carefully before you believe a word they say. Anybody want to hazard a guess who said that? Richard Dawkins said that. He wrote that in an open letter to his daughter to encourage her to question the things people say. And I think that's a very good thing. We ought to do that. We ought to listen to Professor Dawkins. And we ought to say, OK, what is the evidence? And let's look at the evidence. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look at the evidence and we're going to see whether it actually supports uh, Professor Dawkins' thesis or whether, after looking at the evidence, we can still have reason to believe that there might be a creator God. So I'm going to look at four main areas. We're going to look at natural selection because Professor Dawkins claims that natural selection explains why we're here. We're going to look at something he calls the worship of the gaps. He claims that creationists worship the gaps and put God in the gaps. Uh, they're actually a misunderstanding of our position. We're going to look at the origin of life and the variety of life because this is a very important issue when we're thinking about origins, when we're thinking about creation, evolution. Where did we come from? What is the origin of life? And how can we, does evolution, does natural selection explain that variety of life? And we're going to finish off by looking at science and faith because Professor Dawkins has some very interesting things to say about what faith does to science. And we're going to look at the evidence there too. So let's look at natural selection with some more quotes from Professor Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. He claims that Darwinian natural selection is the only known solution to the riddle of where the information comes from, the information contained in living systems. We all have a, a genetic code, and that genetic code contains information. Where does the information come from? Well, Dawkins says that Darwinian natural selection is the only known solution to that riddle. He also says that slowly increasing complexity explains the illusion of design. Biologists often talk about design, they do it all the time. And they often get misunderstood because some people think that if they're talking about design, there must be a designer. Well, when I talk about design, I do mean there must be a designer. But Professor Dawkins suggests to us that slowly increasing complexity actually explains this illusion of design. And he claims, in fact, that natural selection is a better alternative than the God alternative. So let's look at uh, natural selection. Let's, let's just look at some of, a couple of examples of natural selection, and let's see what natural selection can do for us. Well, of course, we've all probably heard about Darwin's finches on the islands of the Galapagos off the coast of South America and the Pacific. There are 14 species, or give or take, Maybe, maybe there are 12, maybe there are 15. It's a bit unclear. But there are about 14 species of finch. And here are the pictures of some of them. And they differ mainly in beak size and shape. So the, the distinguishing features of these different species are the, are the beaks. You look at the beak and you can identify different species. And this is mainly associated with the different types of food that they eat. There are other differences as well. But we're going to just look at uh, the beak uh, and, and the diet that these finches use to survive and what that teaches us about natural selection. Here we have uh, one of the finches with a very large beak, Geospitza magnirostus. Rostris. I don't know why I didn't do Latin. And then we have G. scandens, 
And you can see the beak size is different. We've got on the, on the left-hand side a bird with a very deep beak and the, on the right-hand side a bird with a narrow beak. And this is associated to the, to the type of food they eat. And the, the bigger, stronger beak you have, the larger, harder seeds you can eat. And there's quite a lot of research that has been done on these finches by a couple, the Grant couple, Mr. and Mrs. Grant, who've lived on the island and worked very, for 20 years or more studying these finches. And there's lots of different evidence that shows how the size of the beak determines the size of the seeds there. Here's a graph. You've got three finches here, smallest beak on the, on the left and the largest beak on the right. And the larger the beak, the larger the seeds. So the, the bird on the right-hand side there eats seeds that are about five to seven millimeters in diameter. And they, they, can, they can crunch those up and survive quite happily on them. But what happens in terms of natural selection is that as things change on the island, the size of the beaks change. change. And here we have some very interesting work which is affected, we find that the beak is actually affected by the weather, well, not directly by the weather, because the weather affects the amount of seeds that are available, the type of seed that's available. So in dry weather, you tend to have less seeds which are harder, more shriveled up, more difficult to eat. So the birds tend to have larger beaks, because the larger your beak, the more force you can apply, and you, the more easily you can obtain food. Whereas if you've got a small beak, you tend to do very badly in these kind of conditions, because the food is too difficult to eat. So you tend to die out. So what you find is as you measure the beak depth over the years, starting from 1979 up until uh, 1982, there are, some very, there are some blips. Every time the, it's a very dry year, the seeds type that's available is very hard and dry. So the beak size of the finches you find has increased because the ones with the small beaks can't eat, so they die. So we, here we have uh, natural selection in operation. Basically, the food is the environment that changes as a response to the weather, and the weather can have a big effect on the, on the type of bird you find. Well, big effect. Actually, we're only talking about a few millimeters in beak size, but it is, is a difference. And then when, the, when there's wet weather, they get more seeds are available, which are much easier to eat, and you get the birds with the smaller beaks coming back. So you can measure the beak size, and this is exactly what happened in uh, 1984. Wetter weather, but the beak size decreased because there's much more uh, available food and the, and the type of seeds that are available were much easier for the, the birds with small beaks to eat. So here we have natural selection. We have the survival of the fittest. Those birds which are best adapted to survive in the harsh conditions survive. Those which, that which uh, are not able to obtain food, they of course die and don't leave many offspring. So you have a variation in beak size responding to that environmental condition. And that's observable biological effect. That's natural selection. And I have no problem with natural selection. Natural selection is an observable thing. You can measure it. You can, you can quantify its effects, just as has been done here. And this is nothing, nothing to challenge anybody's faith. I'm perfectly happy with the idea of natural selection. And it's not going to cause me any problems. So there are many things where I can agree with Dawkins. And I agree that natural selection is a very important uh, phenomenon in biology and it's very important in understanding biology and how biology operates. Let's just look briefly though at genetic variations and how that fits in with the story. Again picking one of the uh, very well known examples of evolution, the, uh, the peppered moth and a, a phenomenon called industrial melanism. You may well know the story. The peppered moth is a moth which is got a, a basically mottled pattern and you have here in this picture actually two moths, one of which is rather more easy to see than the other. There are two varieties of pepper moth, one is a dark form, one is the lighter form and in case you're having trouble the lighter form one is here in the green circle. Uh, you can probably see it now. And what happens is the story goes with pollution it, during the industrial revolution the, the pollution killed the lichen on the trees, turned the tree, tree, tree trunks black and so these light coloured moths were much uh, easier to see, and the dark moths replaced the light form. Here we have evolution in action. Here we have actually a, a change in gene frequency because the gene for the dark form became more common than the gene for the light form, except it probably isn't just one gene. It's probably a bit more complicated than that. But it's an example of evolution in action, or at least it's believed to be an example of evolution in action. And here we have pictures which show you the, the two different forms on two different backgrounds. On the left-hand side, you have the normal tree with a lichen, which is light-colored, and the, the, the light-colored moth blends in very, easy, very well with that lichen and is not visible. And on the right-hand side, you have the darkened, soot-covered tree trunk, and, of course, the light-colored form is much more visible. And if you're a bird looking for lunch, 
you're going to spot the light-colored uh, moth on the dark background, and you're going to eat it. So the dark one survives, and the light one disappears. And there's a, there's a, a selection for the dark form over the light form. So you get a change in distribution, you get a change in frequency of the two different forms, which can be interpreted as a change in, in gene frequency driven by natural selection. But there's actually a, a bit more to the story than that. There's been a bit of controversy about the, um, the peppered moth, and there's been some evidence that's come forward suggesting that the results that were initially published back in the 1950s were not as well founded as was believed. And recently there's been a, a swing back in the other, other direction, but we're going to look at that briefly. But here's some problems for the peppered moth story, which shows it's a little bit more complicated than sometimes presented. Here we have a, a, a chart of Great Britain prepared in 1971, where you have the distribution of the different forms of moth. We have circles here. If you have an open circle, that means 100% of the moths are the light form. If you have a, a closed black circle, that means 100% are the darker form. And then you've got a, a pie chart effect where you've got less or more or less the lighter area, that's basically showing you the distribution, proportion of the two forms in different parts of the country. And it works very nicely for Liverpool where you've got pollution, the dark forms uh, are the most uh, predominant form. But then you've got the distribution is actually rather strange because you can find in some areas where there's no pollution, 80% of the moths are the dark form. So why are they there? Surely they'd all been eaten by the birds, so they'd be much less than uh, 80%. So this is the first problem with the story. The, dark, the light form persists even in polluted areas. But as I say, there's been some research done, and there's actually some work, work published uh, in August 2007 by a gentleman called uh, Majerus. I don't know how he pronounces his name. That's how I pronounce it. He's based in Cambridge University, and he was interested in this story, and he published some, some material that actually caused a lot of people to question the story and say, well, this is not actually as good evidence for evolution as we believed. And he said, well, I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to show that it was quite good evidence. So he's started to, he's been repeating some experiments. He spent six years between 2001 uh, <clears throat> and 2006 doing capture and release experiments near Cambridge with the, uh, the light and the dark form of the moth. And what he found was actually, yep, the story seems to be confirmed in that the more dark forms are eaten than the light forms because... Uh, contrary to what was, what was uh, said before, uh, at one time there was some evidence suggesting that the moth didn't actually land on the tree trunks at all, so it wasn't actually visible to any birds, so they couldn't eat them. Whereas, in fact, he's found that they do tend to land on the trunk as well as on the branches. So, yeah, as far as that uh, part of the story is con concerned, it seems to be uh, confirmed. So, and predation, in other words, being eaten by a bird, is a major cause of the decline of the dark form, because now in Cambridgeshire, what's actually happening is the dark form is becoming less common and the light form is more common, rather than the, the original uh, event, which was the pollution, which caused the dark form to become common. So, yeah, we seem to have a mechanism to explain natural selection in action, causing a change, change in gene frequency. But <clears throat> it's not quite so simple because the dark form still persists. So whatever happens, in most areas, you still find dark moths. But uh, overall... There is definitely a change in gene frequency, and natural selection does seem to be one of the factors that is driving this. So we, are, we, we have to conclude, yes, natural selection is doing something. Natural selection is a, a real effect that we can measure and we can understand. And, yeah, natural selection does do something. Natural selection eliminates the unfit. If you're not fit to survive, you get eliminated in a natural world. In, uh, when we talk about human beings, of course, we protect our weak, weaker members so they don't get wiped out. But if you're, living, uh, if you're a moth living on a tree, it's uh, nature red in tooth and claw. Uh, natural selection will eliminate the unfit. Only the strongest and the best adapted will survive, and we have no problem with that. But random mutations reduce fitness generally. Not always, but generally. And, of course, natural selection eliminating the unfit will tend to stop changes. And the one thing about natural selection that's never actually been demonstrated, and this still stands, is natural selection has never been observed to produce new features. And we're going to come back to this later at the end. But what we can say positively about natural selection is natural selection can cause changes in gene frequency, and the peppered moth is probably quite a good example of that. Natural selection does cause survival of the fittest. That's a, a well-established concept that can be demonstrated with the evidence. And it probably causes speciation. 
and you can, uh, one species can be split off into two different species and diverge slightly in appearance, or just like your, the, the, the Galapagos finches, you started off with one species of finch on the island, and over a period of time, we have now 14 different species, although we have to remember that actually a lot of these species do interbreed, so they're not true separate species. But yes, natural selection is uh, a phenomenon that can be observed, and it's probably a very important uh, principle of biology. But it's one thing it doesn't explain, and, it's, and no biologist has been able to explain the arrival of the fittest. Natural selection explains the survival of the fittest, not the arrival of the fittest. And that is a problem which is actually recognized by biologists who aren't creationists, they, biologists who are in the mainstream of evolution. They, a lot, quite a lot of them are, are now acknowledging that there is a problem. Natural selection is a powerful force, it can do quite a lot, but there are limits to what it can achieve, and it doesn't actually explain the arrival of novelty. So let's look at an example that Dawkins picks up on, natural selection and the eye. This again is a very um, well-known argument in creationist circles. It comes up time and time again, and of course, with, as the debate goes on, the evolutionists and creationists discuss uh, the origin of the eye. Can evolution explain the origin of the eye? Now, somebody once said this, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And that was Charles Darwin who said that. So he recognized the problem, and he recognized that the I was one of the problems. And so that I don't get uh, accused of quote mining, I will go on and complete the quotation, which is Darwin concluded, but I find no such case. Darwin claimed that he has solved the problem that actually natural selection could produce something as complex as an eye. Although if you read what he says, it's rather thin on actual hard evidence. It's kind of, yeah, if we imagine this and imagine that, maybe we can arrive at something as complicated as an eye. So we're now moving into the idea of, co of irreducible complexity. And the question I want to address here, is the eye irreducibly complex? So a few definitions, and actually Richard Dawkins gives us a definition of, of irreducible complexity in his book. A functional unit is said to be irreducibly complex if the removal of one of its parts causes the whole to cease functioning. And that's quite a good definition. I don't have any problem with that. Then he goes on to say, this has been assumed to be self-evident for both eyes and wings. And then Richard Dawkins goes on to do a fairly good job of demolishing that argument. And I would agree with him because actually, as far as I know, no creationist has claimed that the eye or a wing is irreducibly complex. They claim it's complex and it can't evolve, but nobody's actually said that it's irreducibly complex. So I actually think that Richard Dawkins is getting a little confused between irreducible complexity and complexity. <clears throat> and in fact, we're going to talk about that a bit later because it's a very important point. But I want to just talk about the eye for a while because the eye is a very uh, interesting organ. The eye is rather complex. And that's, this is the diagram of the eye that you would observe if you cut, it, cut somebody open and had a look at their eye. And here is a, a, a diagram of the retina of the eye. And I'm not going to go through and point out all the various parts. All I want you to appreciate is, and I'm sure you do appreciate this, this is very complicated. So we have a, a, an organ which is, which is sensitive to light. It's self-cleaning. It's got automatic protection system. It's got automatic exposure control operates at high and low intensity, focuses with a multi-element lens, doesn't have any chromatic aberration. The, 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 the complexity of the eye is absolutely amazing. We would like to have a camera as good as our eye to take pictures with. So the question is, can evolution explain this? Now, Darwin is claimed to have solved the problem. Well, his claim is a bit hollow because evolutionists are aware there's still a problem and there's been modern efforts to explain the uh, evolution of the eye. And two gentlemen by the name of... Uh, Nielsen and Pelger in 1994 wrote a paper called A Pessimistic Estimate of the Time Required for an Eye to Evolve to demonstrate that actually it's quite easy to evolve an eye. So they started off with an eye spot, which is basically a light-sensitive patch of, of cells which responds to light so that an organism can detect whether it's light or dark. And starting with an eye patch, they claimed that you could, by slow, gradual steps, just like Darwin suggested in his theory of evolution, produce a very complicated eye like the eye that we have. So they gradually evolved the eye by adding small different features 
through many small changes. And they go through many steps. Here we have uh, 600, uh, sorry, 362 steps from the eye spot to a slightly more advanced eye where you've got a depression which gives you a larger area to collect the light and start to getting uh, light collected together in a kind of pit. And as you go through the process, it slowly changes. They, their model of the eye slowly changes until you get to something like a pinhole camera, which is actually quite a reasonable eye. If you've ever made a pinhole camera, you can get quite a decent image with a pinhole camera. And this eye is, is fairly common in nature. And here they, they add some more features. You get the lens added, and you get uh, a cornea added. And they claim that in about 1,800 steps, you can evolve from an eye spot to uh, a rather complicated eye like the eye that we have. So far, so good. There are a few problems, though. We'll come to that in a minute. And here they say, OK, we can show this is the case because we can look in nature and we can look at the eyes of various creatures and we can show all the various stages actually existing today. So on the top left there, you have an eye spot. And in the bottom right, you have the eye of a, a cephalopod, a squid or um, an octopus, which is a very advanced eye. And they say, look, it happens. Well, actually, there is, there, as I say, there is a problem. I want to go back to uh, looking at a creature called Nautilus. Nautilus is a, is a mollusk related to, uh, well, in biological terms, related to a snail, although the relationship I would question. But it's, it is a living submarine, very complicated living submarine with a multi-compartmented uh, multi ballast chamber, jet propulsion. And the interesting thing about this creature is it's found in just about every single geological age. So wherever you look in the rocks, you tend to dig up a Nautilus or something very like a Nautilus. And here's a Nautilus swimming across the page for you. Uh, but the in one interesting thing about this creature is it doesn't seem to evolve. So a Nautilus you dig up that's supposed to be 400 million years old looks like a Nautilus today in all the essential features. But when we're talking about eyes, the eye of the Nautilus is very interesting because the Nautilus has a pinhole camera eye, which is not very complicated. Here's a picture of the eye of the Nautilus. Here's a diagram of what it looks like. But its eye has not evolved in 400 million years. Now, the whole point of, uh, of Nielsen and Pelger's paper was to demonstrate it's actually quite easy to evolve an eye. Okay, well, if it's quite easy to evolve an eye, how come the Nautilus is still going around with a simple eye and hasn't seemed to advance? Well, I would suggest there's a reason it stopped with a pinhole camera eye, even though the changes are supposed to occur easily, because you need something extra. Here's a pinhole camera eye, and here's an eye with a lens. Well, where does the lens come from? How do you gradually evolve from an eye with no lens to an eye with a lens? Well, that's not gradual evolution. You've added something new. So the question is, uh, how do you add that new thing? Where does that new information come from to give you the, the lens? And then you've got the cornea as well across the top, which is also part of the focusing system. In fact, you might not be aware, but in your eye, the major lens that does the focusing is actually the cornea, not the lens inside. The lens inside just allows you to read or not as, the, as you get older when it goes hard and you can't accommodate anymore. So the question here is, why did the Nautilus stop with a pinhole camera eye? And it's not enough to say, well, it's good enough, because if it's so easy to evolve a more complex eye, why didn't it evolve a more complex eye? Because it actually would have made it a much more efficient creature. It stops. Well, maybe there's a problem with evolution. But there's more to it than that. The, the, eye is a very in, the eyes that we have is quite interesting in that it's different from the eyes of something like Nautilus, it's, and it's uh, been claimed to be wired backwards wired badly backwards, but that's another debate which not, we're not going into. But I want to just demonstrate a, another problem with the evolution of the eye. Here we have the, uh, a light-sensitive cell and the nerve. Let's assume where the light-sensitive cell and the nerve exist. Now, first problem is, where did that come from? Because Nielsen, Nielsen and Pelger assume the light-sensitive the light cell. Now, the light-sensitive cell itself has got some very complicated biochemistry inside it, which I haven't got time to go into. Where did that come from? So here we have a light spot, an eye spot, sorry, with different light-sensitive cells and all the nerves connected to the, the brain of the creature. The nerve fibers collected together to form the optic nerve, and here is the outside of the animal. So the light comes in here, detected by the light-sensitive cells, signal goes down through the nerves to the brain, and the animal moves away or moves nearer to whatever it's watching. So far, so good. But our eyes are not wired like that. Our eyes are wired differently. We've actually got a hole in our eye called the blind spot. And if you use the same simplistic diagram of what an eye would look like with the nerves, the nerves actually go from the top 
and disappear down through the hole, your blind spot, and then go through to your brain. Now, the vertebrate eye did not evolve from a mollusk eye, did not evolve from a nautilus eye or a squid eye. They're different paths. They'd have to evolve independently. So the question I ask here is, when did the eye change from being wired the right way round, as some people would have it, to being wired the wrong way round or, or upside down? Well, uh, I haven't yet heard an answer to that question. Um, remember, what we're doing is we've got to evolve from this to this. And it's not simple to do because the diagram might look very simple. You say, okay, well, that's simple to do because there's only a few components. But remember, you're rewiring this. And that's not simple. You can't just flip it over. It doesn't work. And there's a whole lot of uh, anatomical reasons why it doesn't work, a whole lot of biochemical reasons, which I haven't got time to go into, which why it doesn't work. But I would suggest to you that this is a major challenge to Darwinian evolution because you can't... You can't slowly and gradually evolve from the one to the other. It's an all or nothing change. It's a quantum leap or a paradigm shift, if you like. So the eye is not irreducibly complex, I agree. But the eye is complex and the evolutionary explanations are not adequate to explain how we got to it. Let's move on. Richard Dawkins accuses us creationists of worshipping the gaps. We like gaps, he says, because we like to put God in the gaps. And there's a problem with that, and I recognize that problem, and I agree with him. Uh, we can't have a god of the gaps, because as the gaps disappear, so does God. So if you just rely on the gaps to put your god in, you're not going to get very far, you're not going to last very long. But that, again, is a caricature of, of creationist position. We don't actually worship the gaps. We don't actually uh, look all the time at the gaps and say, ah, oh, look, a gap, there must be a god. Our argument is a bit more sophisticated than that. So I want to address that uh, that side of the argument just briefly by looking at out of place fossils and then I want to look at irreducible complexity because this is part of the argument as, as Dawkins would have it we creationists he says say something's irreducibly complex we can't explain how it evolved therefore God must have done it uh, and we're going to look at the bacterial flagella as an example of complexity and irreducible complexity but let's just go, go back to some quotes from Richard Dawkins where the issue lies he said, if an apparent gap is found, talking mainly about the fossil record, but other gaps in knowledge as well, any gap in scientific knowledge, he says, we fill it by God as a default answer. And he call, accuses us of being intellectually lazy. And talking specifically about evolutionary transitions, for, for which there are many gaps, and he admits there are gaps, uh, although he doesn't admit there are as many as we would have, there are, he says many evolutionary transitions are elegantly documented. Well... Some of the smaller ones are. Some of the big ones aren't actually elegantly documented. And in response to the question that the creationist asks, how do you falsify evolution, he quotes uh, a famous evolutionist, uh, J.B.S. Haldane, and says, it's very simple. If you want to prove evolution wrong, dig me up a piece of Precambrian rock with a rabbit. How to falsify evolution? Well, rabbits in the Precambrian. That, will, that would answer the, the case quite nicely. If you can show me a rabbit from the Precambrian rocks, I believe that evolution is no longer true because that can't happen. And that's fair enough. But let's look a bit more detail at that. Just a quick reminder, a bit of geology here so we understand what the Precambrian is. Here is a, um, a diagram of the geological column with different periods. Uh, coming from the bottom, the oldest period is the Cambrian. The Precambrian is before then. And then working out, you've got the Ordovician, the Silurian, Devonian, the Carboniferous, the Permian, and so on. And down in the, in the Cambrian, you've got things like trilobites, and in, in the Devonian and the Silurian and the uh, Ordovician, you've got fish of different varieties. Birds appear in the fossil record about the Carboniferous, or sorry, the Cretaceous. And mammals uh, appear a bit later also in the, uh, sorry, the birds are in the Jurassic and the mammals in the Cretaceous. And that more or less is what happens in the rocks. If you dig up these rocks, this is what you find. And there's, there are various uh, questions around that which I'm not going to go into. But I want to move on and I want to address this question about the, 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 uh, uh, the Precambrian rabbit. Here we have a picture, not of the Precambrian, but Cambrian, because actually in the Precambrian there wasn't much life at all, a few, uh, a a few starfish. But why are we not going to find a rabbit in, the, in the, the Precambrian or the Cambrian? Well, because the Cambrian is an aquatic environment, it's watery. All the life in the Cambrian is living in the in seas or in, the, in lakes, and you're not going to find a rabbit hopping around in the sea bottom. <laughs> So that's why you won't find a Precambrian rabbit. Because basically these different geological layers are assemblages of different ecosystems. 
And the, the Cambrian ecosystem is a marine ecosystem. You're not going to find a rabbit. But I can't produce a Precambrian rabbit out of my hat and disprove evolution. But there are many questions which are raised by the fossils. And we don't have a rabbit, but we do have a, a fish called uh, Metapisis attenborii. Why they make these names so complicated to say. That's basically mother fish named after David Attenborough. Now, mother fish is an interesting term. Why is it called a mother fish? Well, we'll come to that. Most fish, as you will know, lay eggs. But some fish give birth to live young. These are the sharks and the rays, which more, more often than not give birth to live young. And this is considered to be an advanced feature. So if, for evolutionary terms, you start off with a fish that lays eggs and you evolve into a fish that lays live young because you have to have a whole complicated system to keep your fish alive. And this is information coming from uh, Nature, published May this year, no less. So it's hot off the press. But this fish, a metapisis, has a uterus, a yolk sac connected to the embryo and umbilical cord. And this was found in the fossil of this fish, which was dug up from the Devonian period. Right, so here we have a, a diagram, a, pic, here a picture of the fish actually giving birth. It's a modern fish, essentially a modern fish, in the Devonian. And it's almost as good as a rabbit in the Precambrian. Not quite as good, but this shouldn't happen. And if you read the article in Nature, the authors are, are quite stunned that this advanced feature is present right at the beginning of the fossil record. And that's not the only example where the evolutionary story doesn't seem to tie up because what you're finding here is very advanced features appearing right at the beginning of the fossil record of any particular type of animal. And birds are another example. The early bird is actually Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is a bird. It's a funny bird. It's an odd bird, but it is a bird. And it appears in the Jurassic rock. So here we have our geological column, Jurassic period here. Remember that as we go to the next slide because... There is a problem with the story because actually there's an even earlier bird than Archaeopteryx. And I haven't got a fossil of it because there aren't any fossils of it, but what we do have, and this was published in Nature in 2002, are footprints. Now, if you look at that, I think if you're fair, uh, unbiased, you're going to say they, they look like bird footprints. And they do look like bird footprints. And the, the authors of the paper actually admit these are Triassic bird-like footprints, actually in the era before the Jurassic. So they shouldn't be there because, we know they shouldn't be there because there were no birds in the Triassic. Okay. It's got four toes. It's got a backward-facing toe. So what we essentially have here is what appears to be perching birds in the Triassic millions of years before Archaeopteryx. So what I'm presenting to you here is not, again, it's not like the, it's pretty much like the rabbit. It shouldn't be there because birds hadn't evolved at this time. So what you find as more and more fossils are dug up of any particular type of fossil, any particular species or group of species, is that you tend to find that as we get more and more evidence, we find that all the advanced features which are present today were also present right at the beginning of each species. And that creates a bit of a conundrum for the evolutionists because they have sudden evolution of all these advanced features, which isn't very Darwinian. So there are problems in the story the evolutionary story. There are gaps. There are problems. So let's move on. Dawkins then addresses irreducible complexity, and we need to address it. He makes a rather bold statement and says, no attempt is made to demonstrate irreducible complexity. Well, I've got a book in my briefcase here called Darwin's Black Box, where a gentleman called Behe spends quite a number of pages demonstrating irreducible complexity, so that's not true to start with. But he does demonstrate irreducible complexity, and he uses the flagella motor of the bacteria as an example. So I want to look at the evidence. I want to follow Professor Dawkins' advice. Let's look at the evidence for the irreducible complexity of the bacterial flagellum. But before we do, I just want to remind you that not all complex objects are irreducible. There's a difference. We need to be careful here. The eye, for example, is very complex, but the eye is not irreducible because you can take bits of the eye away. You can take out your lens inside your eye and you can still see. So your eye is not irreducibly complex. You could, you could take out various bits of your eye and still see things. Not so well, but you could still see. So it's not irreducibly complex. And that's, that's an important point. And we don't claim it is. No, no creationist I know, no creation biologist claims that the eye is irreducibly complex. They claim it's complex. They claim it can't evolve. Different story. But most of us do claim that bacterial flagella are complex and irreducible. You can't take bits away, one bit away, and still have a functioning 
bacterial flagella. But we need to bear in mind we need to separate complexity from irreducibility. A very simple system can be irreducible, and we'll come back to that. Well, let's just look at the bacterial flagella, in case you're wondering what I'm on about. It's a bit, basically a whip-like organ that bacteria have, quite a number of bacteria have, that allows it to move through liquid media. And here we have a picture on the top here of a salmonella bacteria that causes uh, uh, various different uh, intestinal infections. And it has flagella which allow it to swim. And below you have a diagram of the flagella motor, which is the motor that drives the flagella, makes it rotate, and makes the flagella operate like a propeller. And it's got all the components of a motor. It's actually a very complex rotary motor. It has about 40 different components. Now, this is where we have to be careful about complexity and irreducible complexity. You can take most of those components away. If you look at all the different types of flagella motor that there are, you end up with about 20 components that are common to all. So we might suggest that these 20 components are the minimum you need to have a working bacterial flagella. So here is an example where you can't take away any more parts. If you take away any more parts, it stops functioning. So it appears to be irreducibly complex. But the evolutionists aren't going to lie down that easily. They say, well, we can evolve a bacterial flagella. We can evolve the motor. We could just have a process where we can go back to the good old Darwinian principles, slow gradual increase in complexity starting from some basic components. And we, we'll be able to keep it functionally useful at every stage because it has to be functionally useful. It has to do something at every stage. Otherwise, natural selection can't operate. And by gradually changing the function of some components, we can evolve to a more complex uh, bacterial flagellum that we see today. And this process is basically called co-option. You co-opt existing proteins that ex are in the bacterial cell and you change them around a bit and make them into slightly different proteins which do slightly different functions. So this is what the, the evolutionists would say happens. And they appeal to something called the type 3 secretory system which exists in bacteria, which is simpler than a bacterial flagellum. And they claim that you can evolve from a type 3 secretory system to a flagella motor. But the question is, which comes first? And even evolutionists have a problem with the story that the, the type 3 secretory system came first, and they suggest that the evidence supports the, the, the uh, counter-argument that, in fact, the type 3 secretory system is a degenerate form of the bacterial flagella motor. But the evolutionary explanations start with this type 3 secretory system. But we still have to ask the question where it came from, because it's still quite complicated. So where did it come from? Well, they say we take the a ATP synthase and a simple protein export system, put them together, and we end up with a type 3 secretory system. Well, uh, I don't need to, I'm not going to go into detail about what all that is on about, but uh, the ATP synthase is not a simple machine. It's quite a complicated machine, and a simple protein export system also is not a simple machine. It's composed of many different proteins. So both these parts are also complex. So where do they come from? So the evolutionist still has a lot of explaining to do. But I want to look a bit more depth at the evidence because they claim that maybe we haven't got all the evidence we need, but if you look at the proteins that you have in the bacterial flagella motor, and you look at the proteins available in different other systems, they, are, they appear to be similar. They appear to be homologous. They appeal to homology. They say, we have similar proteins doing slightly different things, modified slightly so that they can do a different job. So this is the source of the protein components of the bacterial flagella. So if we, for the sake of argument, allow them their type 3 secretory system, which evolves into a bacterial flagella, we'd expect to find homologous proteins, which are variations of existing proteins. And it is claimed in the literature that all but one of the essential proteins is a homologue of another protein. So now I need to really explain what I'm talking about, because unless you're, you're used to these terms, you, you probably haven't got a clue what I'm saying here. Let's go back in to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a protein which exists in just about every creature on Earth, because it's involved in a in very important metabolic process. So you can go to just about any animal cell and extract cytochrome C, and you can look at its uh, amino acids. Its proteins are made up of amino acids. And you can compare the, the, the cytochrome C from different species, and you can actually look at the differences and say, well, cytochrome C from a human being and, a, and, a, and an ape is very similar. Cytochrome C from a human being and a horse is less similar. Cytochrome C from a bacteria and a human is very different. We can create some sort of evolutionary tree by looking at the differences. And that's what they do. And here we have... Uh, a, a diagram of cytochrome C. And here you have the different uh, amino acids represented as letters. But what I want to show here is a sequence starting from uh, 
the top left here with the letter G for uh, horse size grown seed and then human underneath. And what you have are the, are the differences highlighted. I'm highlighting the differences here for you. So here you have the differences. So pretty much the, the protein is the same in a horse and in a human being, except for these small differences. And so they say, okay, we're not very far, evolutionarily speaking, from a horse. Uh, notice that there are just a few differences. The great majority of the amino acids, the letters are the same. So a G matches with a G, the D with the D, the V with the V, the E with the E. So yeah, there's a lot of similarity. So there we might say we have homology, and the evolution would say that proves evolution. The, the design theorists will say, well, that proves a designer has designed it, and they're reusing similar components. So let's look at homology in the bacterial flagella, where the debate it gets uh, somewhat more heated. And we're going to look at similarities here, which suggest to evolutionists that we could evolve from, uh, in this case, a flagella protein H from a part of, which is the flagella protein H is here marked with the arrow in the base of the flagella. It's part of the, pro the, the motor that drives the flagella. And they say this is very similar to the F-type ATPase F1 protein. And here we have a diagram showing the ATPase with uh, the same, the similar component. So they look at the amino acids and say, well, we've got similarities, or we've got enough similarities to claim homology. Well, how many similarities have they actually got? Here I have three sequences of amino acids. I hope you can see it. Uh, and I'm going to highlight the similarities here, not the differences. Before I start highlighting the differences, here I'm highlighting the similarities. There are a few similarities. All right? There's less than a dozen similarities there. So the most, of the, most of the sequence is different. Yet they claim there's enough similarity to claim homology, that the, that the flagella protein H came from the F-type ATPase. Well, I'm sorry, the evidence is not nearly so strong as for something like cytochrome. I mean, you've got to take a big leap of faith to believe that. What they actually say is they look at different amino acids which ha are similar chemically, but actually different amino acids, and that's where the yellow marks are. And these are similar types of amino acids in the same position. Therefore, there's some sort of functional homology. But the argument is rather weak. And this assumes that you went from the type 3 secretory system to the, the bacterial flagella. And most of the evidence suggests that it's the other way around, that the bacterial flagella came first. And the type 3 secretory system is actually a degeneration which um, causes the bacteria to become pathogenic, which is quite an interesting uh, concept if you're a creationist looking to explain how bacteria became pathogenic. But we won't go there, not tonight. <clears throat> But I want to return back to reducible complexity because it's very important. It's a very strong argument. And I want to re refer to the example that, that, that design theorists use. The mousetrap is an example of an irreducibly complex system. It's actually quite simple. So, and, and to refute Dawkins' claim that we, don't, we can't demonstrate irreducibility, because it can be. It can be actually directly testable. I, I forgot to bring my mousetrap with me, so you're, you're going to have to work with my slides, so I can't let you handle a mousetrap and play with it, but it's got various components. But we have to remember that not all, not all complex systems are irreducible. And this is where Dawkins goes wrong. He thinks we claim they're all, they're all irreducible. And simple systems can be irreducible. This is why we have the mousetrap. Here's a mousetrap. It's got about uh, half a dozen components. It's got a catch. It's got a spring. It's got a hammer. It's got a pivot. It's got a holding bar. It's got a holding bar attachment, and it's got a base plate. Take any one of those components away, and your mousetrap doesn't work. So that is irreducibly complex, or it's irreducible. I would prefer to say irreducible, because when we use the term irreducibly complex, people sometimes get confused, and I think Dawkins has got a bit confused, because he's confusing the two. Uh, irreducibility is actually separate from complexity. And there are many irreducible mechanisms around us that we know are made by human designers. We manufacture them all the time. And the, 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 the crux of the argument is, when we, when we know the source of an irreducible mechanism, it turns out to be a designer. Somebody made it. And there are lots of other things around that we don't know how they appeared. They appear to be irreducibly complex. They appear to be irreducible. But we have no idea where the designer is or whether, how they arose. But we have never observed an irreducible system arise by natural selection unless you assume natural selection in the first place. It's no good to say, well, look, we have all this stuff that evolved. Well, you're, making, you're, you're actually assuming what you're trying to prove. So if we find something that appears to be irreducible, it's very strong evidence there's a designer who made it. And that is the crux of the, the irreducible argument. 
And it's reasonable to assume that if we can demonstrate something's irreducible, that it was designed, and if it was designed, we need a designer. Now, some people are going to say, well, explain the designer. Well, that's a separate question. It's a good question, but it's separate. The, the demonstration design is one thing. Explaining the designer is something else. When an archaeologist digs up a stone tool, they don't have to see the designer to know that it was designed by somebody uh, several thousand years ago. And that's the crux of the irreducibility, irreducibility argument that creation is used. But I want to uh, move on now. Time is passing. The origin of life. The origin of life is a separate question from evolution, and Dawkins is quite correct to point that out. But it's still a question. Where did life come from? And interestingly, Dawkins' answer is luck. And that's what he says in his book. You can read it in The God Delusion. I don't have my copy with me. Do you have your copy, Paul? No, we haven't got a copy of the book with us, so... But he does have it. He says luck. He says once the, uh, the initial stroke of luck has been granted and the anthropic principle most decisively grants it to us, natural selection takes over. We'll come back to the anthropic principle in a minute. The origin of life, the cell with a nucleus and mitochondria, was an even more statistically improbable step than... It, sorry, the origin of the cell with the nucleus and a mitochondria was even more statistically improbable than the origin of life itself. So he's saying, actually, we need a bit of luck there as well. Going from a bacterial cell to an animal cell, which is more complicated, we need a big stroke of luck too. And in fact, there's quite a lot of luck required in Dawkins' story of life. But he claims that it, it's plausible. But actually, I would say that his estimate of the prob probability of life is rather high. He puts it about one in a billion, which is quite generous, highly generous, in fact. It's rather difficult to estimate the probability of life, but we're going to come back to that in a minute. He also says, well, given enough planets in the universe, we're going to have life evolving on some of them, even if it's very improbable. So if life evolves, the probability of life is one in a billion, and if we have a billion billion planets, you're going to have life evolving on a billion planets. Now, this is basically what he, what he means by the anthropic principle. He's saying that because there are so many planets, one planet somewhere is going to be suitable for life, and the planet that has life on it is a planet that's suitable for life. Because we're here to observe it, we must be on a planet that's suitable for life. That's basically what he's claiming from the anthropic principle. But he also, I believe, overestimates the power of natural selection, which is why I talked about natural selection earlier. Natural selection can do so much, but it cannot produce novelty. And it's not only creationists that are saying that. There's actually a group of evolutionists who are now known as the Altenberg 16, kind of heretical group, that's saying Darwinian natural selection doesn't work. We need something else. And I would agree, we do. I don't agree with their answer, but I agree we need something else. So Dawkins actually appeals to luck quite a lot. Lucky events in the history of life. Uh, life appears by chance. The first cell with a nucleus appears by chance. But it doesn't stop there. To get from a single cell to a, an organism that's more than one cell, you need more chance. And he admits that. And segmentation appears by chance. Segmentation just means an animal made up different segments, like an earthworm. Uh, but that's quite a a biological innovation, if you like, uh, and it's, uh, again, something that appears by chance. And he appeals to chance rather a lot, but he says, given enough planets, we can have chance getting us to where we are today. So even if it's very, very improbable, it's going to happen if we've got enough planets for life to occur on, because life must be evolvable. But he hasn't proved it. He's making that assumption. And one thing for me that says... Well, hang on a minute, there's a bit of a problem here. Let's look at what we need to have the simplest cell, the simplest unit of life. What do we need? Well, there's actually a group who've been researching this, and they've published a paper on the minimal bacterium. Say, so, okay, we take a bacterium, and it's been published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in January 2006 by uh, a group owned by uh, J. Craig Venter. He was one of the guys involved in the Human Genome Project, and he's trying to make life in the laboratory which is an interesting exercise. But he says, OK, we want to make life in the laboratory. We need to know what we're dealing with. What's the simplest unit of life that we, can, we need to have to, to, for it to be sustainable? So what they did, they took a bacteria. In this case, it was a mycoplasma bacteria, which is a parasitic bacteria. And he started chopping out the genes by a process which we don't need to worry about. And he came up with a number of the minimum number of genes required to sustain life. It's 382. Now, that is probably an irreducibly complex system. Explain that, how that arises. If that's the minimum requirement for life, how do you get from chemicals to life if that's your minimum requirement? 
Now, you might come back to me with lots of different arguments about how they've been studying prebiotic systems and their hypercycles and, and ribonucleases and all sorts of stuff. But yeah, okay, that does so much, but it doesn't explain it. You still have got massive gaps in, in the story. So I would, I would argue that, in fact, you're wasting your time because life does not evolve from non-life. Life appears to be designed, and I believe it is designed, and it needs a designer. But I want to address one final point in Dawkins' book where he basically says, if you're a creationist, you become a useless person and you can't do good science. So one of his arguments is, if you're a creationist, you just shut down the scientific enterprise. Well, I, I would like to suggest that uh, Dawkins is wrong here, and I want to address the issue of science and faith. Dawkins claims, if you do not understand how something works, never mind, just give up and say God did it. That's what he says. That's, he caricatures the creationist and says that's what they do. Well, actually, that's not true. If you look at the history of science, that statement is falsified straight away. And I would want to address this by quoting five examples of scientists who believed in God and what they did. I'm going to start with uh, Johann Kepler, 1571 to 1630. What did he do? He was a believer. He believed in God. He believed God created the planets. Did he just say, God created the planets? I'm not going to look at them and study them. No, he's, he developed the laws of planetary motion. He was the founder of celestial mechanics. And he said that he was just thinking God's thoughts after him. He was looking at how God had designed the universe and trying to understand it. And he saw that as part of his duty as a believer, as a Christian. And he was the first to use that phrase, and other scientists since have used that phrase. We're studying God's creation. We don't just sit back and say, oh, God did it, we're not interested anymore. We want to understand it, we want to use it. Another example, Robert Boyle, 1627 to 1691. He was basically the father of modern chemistry, and he invented Boyle's law, which describes the behavior of gases. Another believer, he believed in the God of the Bible, and he did an awful lot to advance the scientific uh, enterprise. Moving a bit closer to home, more modern times, we're going into the 18th century. Michael Faraday, 1791 to 1867, he discovered electromagnetic induction, which is basically what makes your electric motor work, and he also invented the generator, which gives us electricity. So without Michael Faraday, we'd be still waiting around for the first electric generator so that we could have lights and computers. Maybe it was a bad move. Uh, maybe he should not have done it. But he's done it. He developed electricity, if you like. Let's move closer to home. Let's come to Edinburgh. James Simpson, 1811 to 1870. He was a professor of obstetric medicine in Edinburgh University. And he developed chloroform anesthesia. And he was the founder of anesthesiology. And another believer, a Christian who believed the Bible, believed in the God of the Bible. And he also happened to be a Scotsman, so it can't be bad. Uh, James Clark Maxwell, another Scotsman. He has a building named after him in uh, Edinburgh University, I believe, uh, 1831 to 1879. Uh, he is the father of electromagnetic field theory, and I don't understand it either. <coughs> and he also developed the statistical, therm statistical thermodynamics, and various commentators of science have suggested that his contribution to science is equal to that of Newton and Einstein. And he was a firm believer in the Bible. He believed in a personal God, uh, and he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ who saved him from his sin. So Dawkins' contention that being a Christian, being a believer in the Bible, makes you a useless scientist is actually wrong. If we'd waited around for all the atheist scientists to do all this stuff, we'd still be waiting, perhaps. Maybe I'm being a bit unkind. But it does make you wonder, and Dawkins can't claim uh, that being a Christian makes you a useless scientist. Because creation scientists, creationist scientists, have actually been very successful scientists and very important scientists. So I've got two slides now. As a conclusion, you'll be glad to hear. I want to just summarize really what I've been saying. I want to focus first on the limits of natural selection. Natural selection has limited effects. It occurs. It's a biological phenomenon. You can study it. You can quantify it. But it cannot produce life. And it cannot produce new features. Natural selection cannot get you a cell with a nucleus. It can't get you a many-celled organism. It can't get you segmented organisms. It can't get you a whole lot of things, in fact. So it's limited. So life, and the, the variety of life all around us, seems to be designed. 
And it's a, it's a logical conclusion to conclude that it is designed. And if there is a designer, we need a designer. If there's a design, sorry, we need a designer. And to come back and say, well, the designer's got to be more complex than the things he designed, well, that's true, perhaps. Uh, but that's not necessarily meaning that we don't need a designer. It doesn't falsify the argument that design needs a designer. And I would like to argue that in, in contrast to Richard Dawkins, why I think God most certainly exists, God, Dawkins thinks he's proved that God almost certainly doesn't exist. Well, I think if you observe what's, what's around us, if you, if you study biology, design is verifiable, and design means a designer. And further than that, the design of the world, we can actually look at the design of the world and discern something about the type of designer. We can actually say, well, look, the world's made to work in certain ways, therefore the designer must be a certain type of designer. And I would like to suggest to you that the design of the world is objective evidence for God's existence. It's not sufficient evidence, but it is objective evidence that we can use to support the contention that God exists. And evolution is not going to, it's not a designer substitute, not, not for me, an adequate designer substitute to explain the existence of the universe. So there I've finished a very quick uh, critique, if you like, of chapter four of the God Delusion, explaining why I, as a scientist, still believe in a God, and I still think the evidence supports the existence of a, a God who made everything.